You are listening to a podcast of Ice and Fire, episode 233 for the week of September 2nd, 2018. Welcome back to the longest running podcast dedicated to George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series and occasionally HBO's Game of Thrones. As usual, this is Amin, and I'm joined by a special a panel today. Who is their secret order? No. <laughs> <laughs> by VOK Supremacy, which ranks in VOK. <laughs> the seat to Duncan. Duncan's high up, isn't he? Yeah, yeah Duncan's <laughs> highest. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll go first. Hey, this is Duncan, <laughs> also known as Valkyrus on the forums. This is Zach, also known as Alias on the forums. This is Bill, known as Mr. Corb on the forums. And this is Bing, Shushan on the forums. And Bing only speaks last because of the search engine. That's why. He's yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> One day, Microsoft. Yeah, that's right. So I just wanted to, to do a little special episode because it's nice to do episodes on subtopics. And I had read an article recently called Game of Tropes, The Orientalist Tradition in the Works of George R. R. Martin by uh, Matt Hardy uh, from Deakin University, Australia. And he's not the first person to write or talk about the issue of Orientalism in the work, but he's the first that I've seen that's actually written a full article on it. So I thought that's an interesting time to talk about this article in depth. And that's why I wanted to get the panel here. Before we get into it, I do want to mention, I disagree with a lot of this article, but it doesn't mean we can't still discuss it. And I think it's an issue that should be discussed from the angle of an open discussion. Like a lot of times things like Orientalism, unfortunately, are taken to an extreme where they just shut down discussion. And I want to have an open discussion here, the opposite of that. So it's, it's a two-part article. The first part has an, kind of an introduction or summary of what, what's the concept of Orientalism. And I'm just wondering, you guys, if, if it's accurate or what you think of that a summary. So the, the introduction part basically just points out a bunch of things about, I mean, this introduces the book, which I don't know at this point how much introduction you need for the book. So, okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the idea of Orientalism comes from the book titled Orientalism by Edward Said, who is a, a literary scholar who, and he, he himself was Egyptian. And this concept specifically refers to the way in which the West people or writers, artists, scholars have portrayed the East in a specific way that doesn't really – that is sort of a, has an exotic picture, that paints an exotic picture of the East or basically non-West that has very little to do with the actual reality of what's going on in those areas. And I mean it's now regularly assigned reading in colleges – I think. I mean, I, I have not read the whole book ever, but I've read the introduction <laughs> chapter, or the main of that of that book, maybe four or five, five times now. I have, I own this book. My mom owns this book, so I don't know what everyone else's experience is with this book, though, or this idea is, though. I think we covered it for like one week in my honors program at university, so I'm I definitely right. don't know much about it. But yeah, the general gist is that. European historians and artists and various political organizations would paint the East as inherently exotic and backwards and stagnant and crumbling in contrast with the West, which was painted as familiar and developed and rational and progressive. Yeah. And I guess the analogy that's often used is that civilization advances with the sun. So it rises with in the East and it sets in the West. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that Europeans didn't necessarily weren't necessarily in awe of a lot of these Eastern civilizations, but they considered them past civilizations that had reached right. some apex. And Orientalism, and it's depicted in art as much as it is it is in political thought. So it reaches various, you know, a, a wide discourse. But it was often used as a rationalization for colonization. It was, you know, we have to go and save these people from themselves. They can't govern themselves. They're falling apart. That kind of thing. Right. And, and, all, and a lot of the sort of the portrayal is sort of a very static image. I think the specific focus of this article is on various fantasy slash fantasy literature slash Hollywood movies, which is where he brings in later on Game of Thrones slash A Song of Ice and Fire. He talks about the Raiders of the Lost Ark, mm. uh, various sort of um, iterations of the Arabian Nights or the Assassin's One Nights. Um, yeah, yeah. So in this case, not so much. This is not so much sort of the things like Kipling, which is immediate justification of 
colonization or be used to for the justification of colonization, but being sort of more like repeating a lot of the stereotypical stereotypes and cliches that mm-hmm. has that was created during those periods. Yeah, like the impetus of Orientalism is perhaps dissipated to somewhat, but a lot of the tropes are preserved in things like right. fantasy, fantasy literature and mm-hmm. and you know swashbuckling or these throwbacks throwbacks to these swashbuckling adventure things like Indiana Jones, um, yeah. all the way up to all the way up to fantasy. I mean, Martin is often described as you know deconstructing or unpacking a lot of the fantasy tropes. But this guy's arguing he actually indulges in a lot of those stereotypes as much as he challenges them. Yeah. So just to give some context on what some of those tropes are, the author does kind of pull out a couple of quotes from the the, the original um, writing from Said here. I'll just mm-hmm. I'll just read these out just so people can get a sense of what those are. So Said describing it as such Orientals or Arabs are thereafter shown to be gullible, devoid of energy and initiative, much given to fulsome flattery, intrigue, cunning and unkindness to animals. Orientals are inveterate liars. They are lethargic and suspicious and in everything oppose the clarity, directness and nobility of the Anglo-Saxon race. And there's this, you know, next piece on kind of the sexual fantasy in this aspect of what what the uh, Western view of the East is, where it's harems, princesses, princes, slaves, veils, dancing girls and boys. The Orient was a place where one could look for sexual experience unobtainable in Europe. Readers and writers could have it if they wished without necessarily going to the Orient. So the you know, the author of this article kind of uh, calling this out in fantasy fiction. Uh, he is obviously, you know, if you heard all that, there's probably some connections you could immediately make to some of the portrayals that we see in A Song of Ice and Fire. He also calls out some other stuff. You know, you guys mentioned some of them. Obviously, uh, you know, Robert E. Howard's Conan is one that he pulls out. He also yeah. uh, points out the uh, the Easterlings in J.R. Tolkien's, obviously, uh, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he mentions Robert Jordan, uh, Wheel of Time, and Robert E. Feist, David Eddings, uh, Stephen Donaldson. Those are some of the names that he mentions. And basically makes the case that, you know, despite the fact that these are fantastical situations, they are kind of still reinforcing and supporting tropes of a, of a sort of, you know, real the real world Western Eastern uh, kind of binary that that Orient being the East and the uh, the Occident, I think it's called. Uh, for the yeah. West. <laughs> the term Orient is, is pretty broad. I mean, this article focused on Middle East, but I think it's definitely gone all the way to China, Japan, anything non-West, mm-hmm. right? But, yeah, yeah the, the way it was originally framed was basically just West and East. Occident mm. being so Occident and Orient, basically the it's us and other. Mm. That's that's the frame that's that's the framework. Mm. Yes, where us is kind of the privileged of the binary, and other is the inferior in all ways, the 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 bad. To the we're, not, that, we're not even necessarily inferior or bad, but just so much as it is the thing that's over there, right. and it is it, we are we are ever developing, ever changing. We. Mm. we 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 are di- we have all these diverse things going on with us. Those guys are static. They're always like that. And and whenever we go back to it, they're still going to be like that. Yeah, and that I mean that's the other or the stranger is a figure right. that appears in literature in psychoanalysis. It is this figure which we invest with all, with all of the things that we see as antithetical to us. So what we see, how we identify ourselves, is is the antithesis of how we identify the other. Um, but you can see in that, you know, maybe energies that we consider forbidden, you know, sexual energies that we place into the other. But then in in so doing, we kind of fetishize the other. Yeah. So I feel like we have a pretty good framework of what Orientalism is. And I don't really disagree with the summary there and the many works that follow into the parts that I have concern with. To what degree does George's work fall into that trope? Because the, the thesis of the article is basically that he's no better than anyone else in this tradition. Like he fits into it. And I'm not sure that there may be parts that I agree with and the parts that I don't. So I think we can go in depth kind of uh, through the second part of the article if we're okay with that. Okay. The first thing he says when he gets there, he's talking about the Starks, for example, being in the North and the most honorable. And straight off the bat, I don't agree with that. I mean, Ned himself is more of an Aaron than a Stark, some people say, right? And if you look at the Stark's history, that's pretty dark. And then you have the other northern people like Bolton. I don't see anything inherently honorable to the north compared to other areas, if you look at it in depth. I mean, I think it's more the way that Martin presents the dichotomy between Westeros and Essos, maybe is what he's critiquing. I mean, I definitely think that 
the more you learn about the Westerosi families, the more gray that morality becomes. But I think the way it's set up, Westerosi society is, it's certainly a very brutal society, but it's more historically familiar to our conceptions of medieval reality. Whereas Essos, at least in the first three books, feels a lot more in line with high fantasy. Um, it feels increasingly weird and unmoored from the permanency of Westeros, as though, you know, anything could happen at any moment. We get, you know, in the first book, we get Mary, the Mary Maz do a ceremony, the birthing of the dragons, then Karth and the House of the Undying. It feels like magic is much more explicit here. And we definitely get magic mm -hmm. in Westeros, but it often seems to come from Essos. So we get Melisandre coming from Essos and introducing uh, magic into Westeros. Um so it seems yeah. like uh, that dichotomy of the, the 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 mystical exotic east is is sort of something that's exists in the east, but it's coming across and poisoning Westeros in some way. Well, and it's again, it's not about good or bad, or even honor versus not honorable. Like some of the worst characters in the novel series are present in Westeros, like people like Joffrey and the Boltons. Those guys are all, but. And and there's plenty of really nice people in Essos, but that that's not the I guess the point. The point is so much is people like Dario with the, his weird beard. The people like what the the magician uh, Piapri with his the, with his weird magic. Uh, like like Duncan said, the uh, Melisandre and the the weird religion that people are unfamiliar with coming over and also there's sort of a lot of i think one of the emphasis of this article was the idea of practice of slavery slavery is yeah. one of the key focuses of the article but I, he underestimates that is far more widespread in essos than he says there's certain places that it's not there but it's a worldwide right. industry and and danny is sending shockwaves through it like that's being felt throughout essos what she's doing well yeah and but the idea of of danny being a sort of a western character going to being in the east and then emancipating mm. slaves sort of the, the idea i mean i she was a slave think, herself but keeping in mind well right? you like, know yeah but so i think the the problem with this article one of my, first i have plenty of problems with this article the first the first problem with this article is that it conflates the tv show with the novel yes. series pretty that's significantly a, that's the biggest mistake and then it says like oh george yeah. was heavily involved in the tv show so yeah that's the footnote like <laughs> well I, it, well that's 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 the, that she doesn't take into account the fact that george's involvement with the tv show gets lesser and lesser over time yes um, and i have no idea what george's creative input is when they filmed the last scene of Season, I think, season three, in which Danny is being hurled around, giving. She's 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 doing. Uh, she's crowd yeah, crowd serving. serving. Yeah. Crowd serving. Yeah. It, that that image was so because the point is the slaves are supposed to be from all backgrounds, right? But, but with yeah. the extras they had there, that wasn't demonstrable, right? So then that whole savior thing was. I mean, many people were talking about this. So this is not the first article to talk about it, but no, you no, keep in mind that that's. The TV show and the two have to be separate, and you can critique both, but just don't mix them together because they're two separate things. Yeah, and, and I think uh, the reason that Essos, in the books at least, feels like a bit a bit more mystical and a bit more magical is because it takes place primarily through Danny's eyes, and she is a child who's been raised, you know, by her brother to disdain the East and glorify the West or the, the Westerosi. So it does feel a bit fairy tale. But I think, you know, in book five, we get more of a sense of the, the nitty gritty sort of politics of the continent as we see through characters like eyes like Tyrion's. Um, and he does actually challenge this notion that the, the Westerners are somehow better than the Easterners when he's when another character makes the point that, you know, servants in Westeros are essentially slaves. They're, they're indentured servants. They, they have none of the rights. They can be killed on, on the, you know, the bizarre whims of their lords. Um, so that dichotomy is, is challenged, you know, in the later books. Um, but I think in the early books, it does feel a bit more fairy tale like Well, the early books are all from Westeros point of view. I mean, Martin uses the, the character POV and the characters yes. themselves, as the article says, of course, will, will have Orientalist views. So that's the whole point. Well, uh, yeah, but Mm -hmm. I think one of, one of the problems, maybe, and, and I'm taking his whoever this person's position is in this, is why are every single character, why exactly. is every single yes. perspective exactly. character in the, in a novel, point of view character yeah. in the novel, a Westeros person? I think yeah. that's yeah. the strongest argument that you can make uh, in favor of what the, the author is kind of claiming here is that you're right. 
there is no character in the series that comes from Essos that has a POV. Um, well, and, except, and for when one, you're, except for one now. Except for one now. Melisandre has one. Oh, and okay. um, one chapter. Right. <laughs> one off. One chapter. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the guy from uh, Novos, uh, the Mar- Axe Man. Yeah, Dorian Martell. Oh, yeah, that's uh, true. yeah, but he's not even in Essos at the time, right? So I mean, he does, well, he does, it's he does the point. The discrepancies, like the differences. Right. Like he's yeah, so, to... yeah, but he's almost a shell. He's almost an empty shell who just remembers yeah. becoming a slave and then being this robotic yeah. soldier. So it's 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 almost doing the Orientals work for him. Exactly. I'm sorry. Just, sorry. Yeah, I broke your point off, Zach. Yeah, just to just to you know wrap it up. You know, the majority of our perspective, uh, you know, by and large, is a very Western one. And when we're talking about, as you said earlier, being this idea of familiar versus unfamiliar, you know, us versus them, um, I versus other, uh, when you don't really have a true POV of the other side, I think that that really makes the case, right, that we don't really see things from the SO side um, and in that way they are the other. Yeah, and uh, I think I, I would agree with that because he's presenting the Aurelis, Orientalist rather mindset <laughs> the same in a similar way that he's presenting uh, a patriarchal or a sexist or misogynistic attitudes in the characters. But in that sense, at least he shows the points of view of men and women, female, char- male and female characters. Whereas, as you say, he doesn't show the viewpoint of the the people from Essos to any real degree. Well, you don't even have to imply that it's a Western story. I mean, Martin himself has been asked, I think, is are there going to be more Essos points of view? And he's like, well, no, this is a story about Westeros, right? So that's his choice in it's a story about Westeros. The question is then, should it be more about Essos? Martin's experience is in Western history. Like, he doesn't know much about the East. So should he be writing more about the East, or should he be writing about what he knows about? I'm surprised the author didn't bring up Dawn, because I feel like Martin was trying to challenge or critique some of that orientalist stereotyping dawn is very much orientalized if that's a word uh, to a large degree we get you know the famous dornishman's wife song which depicts you know dornish women as very sensuous and dornish men as very volatile and i guess we see that stereotype to some degree with um oprah and martell although you could argue he's playing up that stereotype but once we actually get the viewpoints from the people in uh dawn we get we realize that there's actually more shades of detail and complexity Doran Martell is obviously very unlike the stereotype that we get of the Dornish. Ariane, to some extent, plays up the sensuousness. But once we get inside her head, we actually realize there's a lot more complexity. There's a lot more self-doubt. There's a lot more reflection once she, once her, her mission fails. Quentin, famously, is just like nothing. He can't live up to that Dornish ideal of the volatile masculine um, and all that. So I think to some extent, uh, that's where Martin was trying to challenge or critique some of that orientalist um, stereotyping i think you've just pointed out why it wasn't mentioned <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well he does basically. he does mention he does mention it Dorm, but not it, yeah. in detail like he mentioned yeah, it a little right. bit and then but then says oh the main problem to essos but i mean yeah he, he, that's right you do get pov in dorn and i mean ultimately dorn is quite popular in the fandom uh, when it's looked at in depth right We've, and, but it's not that it's everything's good about dorn either it's balanced you get a mix of characters we need to ascertain what exactly is the point of this article because yeah. that's that's actually my main problem with this article. Because oh, I don't know what the point of this article is. Yeah, that's what I felt too. Uh, are there Orientalist cliches, met, uh, images, etc.? Of course. But I that was that is not. I did not need to read this article to know that. I I read the novels. And they're pretty obvious to me. Um, and I think this article does makes a, a lot of the same problem that a lot of many articles. That in, in many academic articles have is basically you you take a, you take a theory a pot, the uh, Orientalism pretty old by now but I guess you br- and then you bring it to to a, a area of study that hasn't experienced this theory much that people haven't used this theory much I guess in this case fantasy literature people have, there's not that much academic studies on fantasy literature and that's not true but. Okay, in this case, Game of Thrones is popular now, so let's apply Orientalism to Game of Thrones and see what we get. There are there are Orientalist attitudes in Game of Thrones, yes, and that's it. Yeah, I think if you his his uh, critique is much more apparent in the show than in the books yeah. because if yes. you look at the show representation of dawn it is absolutely an orientalist you know oh, these yeah. people are sex crazed idiot maniacs <laughs> yeah. just they actually do mess the everything up <laughs> then they're done with oh, yeah. yeah they're disposable they're just they're just um 
yeah, set dressing, titillation, gratuitous violence and sex, and then we're done with them. They've served their purpose. We can write them off. Yep. So they're completely utilitarian, um, unlike the books, which does try to, to go into their characters and understand and I, where they're coming from. Yeah. And so, yeah, this article, there's a lot of gotcha. There's a lot of, oh, yeah, hey, gotcha. I see that you have some Orientalist images in your TV show slash popular TV show slash fantasy series. OK, yes. But then what what do you want, what you want us to do with this information? Do you want there to be less of this? Do you just do you want to have a, some sort of discussion, a greater discussions about fantasy literature with this? He just sort of pointed out and, and then he was done with it. So I kind of feel like there wasn't that much of an argument. Other than, yes, there's Orientalism in A Song of Ice and Fire stuff. But it may not be as obvious to the common person as, as to, to you guys who have, have done reading and research. Sure, yeah. Area, that's, right? well, yeah. That's my experience with this article. It's, I think this article would be a good fit. I do agree. It's a little bit of a shallow analysis. But, you know, yeah. if you wanted to kind of engage uh, a young audience on, like, some of the ideas around yes. post-colonialism, imperialism, um, and, all, and all that, it might be a way to kind of access that. Um, I guess. With yeah. people that are fans of the show and the, and the books. My filter for the, most of this is the books. And I think the strongest place where you can make the kind of Orientalist trope case or even taking it a step further, further the kind of imperialist mm -hmm. situation that's going on in A Song of Ice and Fire, you know, is in Slaver's Bay. Yeah. Is with Daenerys. Obviously, you know, I was reading all those. Uh, the, I was reading that quote earlier with all those kind of tropes and depictions. You can kind of see all of that most clearly in Slaver's Bay. It certainly feels like the most strange and unsettling and mysterious and, uh, and un, you know, place that uh, is a... Uh, most distinct it feels like from the westeros from our our you know perspective that we have uh it does have it does have you know a higher level of sensuality and all those things mm -hmm. and you know ultimately it, it's not you can't really argue that daenerys mm -hmm. when she arrives there is doing anything else than embarking on a uh, imperialist colonial project uh that that is her intention uh, you know not, it's not how it starts out but that is what it becomes she is mm -hmm. going to take control of this place and she's going to make it better you know, going back to the beginning of what we were talking about, that is the kind of West, that is the kind of Western point of view in this, in this uh, imperialist perspective is that we're going to go to you and we're going to civilize you. We're going to make you better. In this case, we're going to free your slaves and we're going to make this a better place. Now, I think the opposite side um, that I think kind of complicates it, I don't think it fully, you know, abs absolves these aspects is that it's pretty clear uh, by the end of A Dance with Dragons that Daenerys's uh, her colonial project has failed, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's and you can make the case that this is almost a sort of deconstructionist post-colonial <laughs> kind of you know viewpoint on it, where it's trying to make the case that yes, colonial projects, imperialist projects don't fundamentally don't work, and, and as they did not for Danny. That's fundamentally where the conflation of the TV show with the novel is highly problematic when you're trying to make this case. Because the TV show is completely lacking of any nuance. <laughs> it's basically, uh, it's basically Daenerys is good. You're supposed to like Daenerys. Uh, ultimately, she wins, and she, her ideas are always good. Whereas the novels, well, well, the problem is the novels. We don't know what happens next. That's right. It's still a work in progress. Yeah, just it is. is somebody eating their microphone right now, or just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what that's. Somebody munching on it. There's alternatives. Yeah, I think we're getting some uh, feedback on on your mic, Duncan. Oh, sorry. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Oh, oh, there it's back. <laughs> oh, sorry. Stop chewing on your mic, Duncan. I know <laughs> this is stressful, but. <laughs> 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 they can continue. I guess you're, you're saying that that, that yep. we don't know how it's going to turn out. I mean, yeah. it hasn't turned out very well so far. And there's arguments you said, like, yes, slavery is bad, and yes, it needs to be fought. We're not saying that you don't try to stop slavery, but there needs to be some internal reform as well, or it just won't be sustainable, right? There needs it, it, the society needs to progress to the point that it can get there. And, and the more that Danny can get the people in the local area involved, the more stable it will be. The more if she just rules externally and just this is what's going to happen, the less stable it's going to be. Oh, yeah. And again, Martin hasn't finished making his argument in a novel. We don't know what the ultimate message of this entire plot is. And I think uh, personally, I think Martin himself is struggling with how he could should deal with the storyline. I mean, mm. I mean, he basically mentioned in various interviews that Marine was the hardest part. I mean, part of it was just apparently some weird timing issue with the Marinese not. But also he has spent a lot of time writing this plot for a reason. He's obviously trying to make some sort of point, but we don't know where that ultimate point is until we get the sixth book. 
What didn't some people speculate that the Marine storyline was possibly influenced by the Iraq war, that it was this yeah. colonial power or this interventionist power trying to fix a post-colonial society and just getting stuck in this quagmire of local politics and uh, trying to liberate a populace that resented them and didn't want to be liberated by them and actively uh, was antagonistic towards the West. And it was just this huge quagmire that no one could figure out how to get out of. And in many senses, we haven't gotten out of. So until yeah. geopolitics sorts itself out, Martin doesn't really know how to sort it out. <laughs> you can see the analogy definitely, but I think the analogy is Vietnam or whatever. Like this, this issue has happened many times. Well, yeah, I, yeah, even before example. Vietnam, you know, yeah. India, Pakistan, you know, yeah. all of the Middle yeah. East, Africa, all these cases. I yeah. think you can see. I, I, I believe pretty strongly that that maybe it's maybe Martin is you know drawing specifically from the Iraq War, but I, I believe pretty strongly he is aware of the concept of of imperialism and he is yeah. he is intentionally trying to address it here. I yeah, think the, well, I think the I point think so. that. I think the point where it gets complicated, though, right, is that it's still a little problematic, right? If, yes. if, yeah. if well, yeah, and and sp specifically, if uh, you know what Daenerys, what we think we, she will ultimately do is kind of she'll make her mess here, and then she'll abandon Essos, and it was kind of just a training ground for her to practice leadership. It was just you know a tool for her ultimately to learn learn from mistakes and become a better ruler when she arrives in Westeros that's that's definitely you know that, that kind of dis, you know using and discarding of of this uh eastern uh, civilization is not uh, the best thing i know and, and she is repulsed more often than not by slaver's bay and by the people of slaver's bay a lot of the description is just the various weirdness the the strange practices the fact that they eat you know, unborn puppies on sticks and things like that. It's just things <laughs> that she cannot understand. There's very, I can't think of a single uh, sympathetic or, you know, three-dimensional Marinese character, really. Because um, we just yeah, don't get that point I mean, of view. The Shave Pate is an interesting character, but even him, you're lacking the sympathetic side. You think he, there would be more. And that's just yeah. partly the well, timing as well. Like, how much is he going to put there? But it, that's that's where the article is the strongest, and that's why it focuses. The point of these cities, and I think everyone accepts it, is almost like these cities are just dead cities, and they're not progressing. That's fitting into the idea of, like, certain areas are just in the past. They can't go forward. Well, I think all of all of the world planetos is stuck in a in a, in a endless, seemingly you know, lack of progress. So as far as that, right. I think his mistake is, and then he says like the other part of Essos is in between. Is like, oh no, I think Essos is actually superior in most ways, except for slavery. I mean, again, I think it ultimately comes down to what what is the point of this? We have that we have these. I think Martin does repeat a lot of tropes and we can go even go beyond the novels we can go into the the world of, of ice and fire his descriptions of or it's not his just his descriptions also elios and linda's descriptions and i'm not sure who how much creative input each have on each they, they have on each side and for, for for the creation of all those countries like et and the China surrogate in the, in this world, or the various other Essosian. Essosian? I don't know. Is that the right <laughs> adjective? Essosian, <laughs> Essosi yes. Uh, uh, states that are not shown prominently in in, in, uh, in the novels. The Jogos Nai, people like that. Sort of the, the fact that these people are, are almost a different race of humans altogether. That, mm -hmm. was, that to me, can, 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 came off a little bit weird. I have to say, as a Chinese person, <laughs> those guys with the giant cone heads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like what? The... <laughs> yeah, it's like um, okay. What what are you trying to do with this? But I, yeah, but again, it's not a good look. Yeah, <laughs> in the world of Ice and Fire, at least, I got the sense that the further away from the Citadel right. it got, the more outlandish it got, simply because they sure. didn't have access to, you know, factual accounts. They hadn't yeah. been there. They were relying sure. on the, you know, the mm. tall tales of sailors and and things like that. Um, and there's the natural barrier of the uh, what are the mountains called? The Bone Mountains, which is, I guess is the equivalent of the Alps, that just completely separates UT from. Western Essos and Westeros. So they have a good exchange with the free cities. They have trade. You've got Ibanez in, in Lannisport, things like that. But UT is just this mystical city that they have no connection with, no trade with whatsoever. So so these crazy stories can emerge out of them because, you know, there's no way to verify it. Sure. But again, it's just 
uh, you can make a sort of a logical case about why that's the case in which the book was constructed like that. Mm. But as a person, someone like me reading it, it still feels, oh, oh, why, why does it have to be this specific way in which these people are described that way? You can say it's because Martin is trying to write like Herodotus. Uh, the further, yeah, so the further away from where he is, the the weirder things get. Sure. It's still, but, it, yeah. but, but Herodotus, when he was writing, he literally, that's that's actually literally all he knows. Martin knows much better than that. Yeah, but in terms of E.T., how did you feel about E.T. and specifically, like we're talking about E.T. now, not the Jogos Nai, like the, their discussion. Yeah, E.T., did yeah. You, uh, did you think they were particularly, like, it, it seemed like they had they had multiple empires and all that, and they uh, had the same problem in the north, or did you think it was too simplified? Uh, I kind of laughed out loud when I read E.T., <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I mean, it reads like someone who, who has a very superficial knowledge of Chinese oh, history. Oh, but, Chinese but, but, but what is he supposed to do? Like, is he supposed to hire yeah, no, uh, like hire well, Bing to come write like that part of the book? Like, <laughs> no, 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 well, no. Well, why do you, why do you want to have ET there? Okay. I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying these things are bad. Mm. So I, I what, think that, that's the important distinction to yeah. make is what's bad and what's like inaccurate. Orientalism is when it's used negatively, I think is that it's worst, right? Like, or when tropes are reinforced, then people can take advantage of them. Well, uh, again, Orientalism is not, it's not even, Saeed, when he was making his case, was sort of was much more aggressive in mm. his rhetoric because he has he is making a very specific. He's coming from a very specific standpoint. He's from Egypt. Uh, he was writing in 1978 at sort of the height of tensions. So there's a very specific political context to when Saeed was he was reading. Since then, Orientalism has been taken to much different places. So it depends on well, what are, what are the goals you're trying to accomplish by pointing this out? I think one possible good thing that could be one possible good positive lesson we can take from is maybe we should have more fantasy novels that are written from the perspective of, say, a Chinese person or a, a Arabic person. That's something that that's more re, that that's more understanding of those cultures. That's actually the perspective of those cultures. So that we don't all whenever we write in this genre, we don't always have to take the perspective of the West, sort of the, the Occidental. Well, to me, I think that is kind of the point. Of sure. this article, ultimately, yeah. I think that that is that is the the message, right? Is that it's just a little kind of disappointing that so many of these you know popular fantasy series are constantly like like you kind of just said, Bing, the city of like why have ET? Why have these Orientalist tropes? Why yeah. do we feel the need to present a fantasy setting in this West East way? Why is that something that we constantly feel like we have to go back to when there's obviously mm. you know so many other ways we could construct. A, you know, a world yeah. we could build a whole world in a completely different way it doesn't have to be yeah. this way the way that ours you know has been mm-hmm. it's fantasy why do you have to have a fake china <laughs> yes but if you're going to have a fake china why well, does fake china have to always be big if, if uh, let's be devil's advocate if he doesn't have fake china at all then people in china are gonna be like where the hell's the chinese people they're not in this world like i'm not i don't know well i don't know i don't know i don't know if chinese people would react i don't think chinese people would realize that there's a china there's a fake china in these <laughs> books right now anyways yeah, but i think yeah. it has to be viewed well it's two different angles i mean if you're saying there should be more chinese writers and more arabic writers it has nothing to do with martin right he's just doing no, his probably story not. probably not but his story, while being Western tradition, is now a world phenomenon. It's being read and viewed around the world. And the TV show as well, TV show in particular. So that's why maybe some people are more interested in who plays in it. It's not just a Western phenomenon anymore. It's an international one. Yeah, again, so I don't know. If, I mean, in more recent days, there has been more discussions over sort of per- portrayal of minorities. And that's, that's actually proof that's connected to the Orientalism yes. argument, but it's not exactly the same. That's right. right. You don't want to mistakenly say it's the same thing. The connection is that, the, yes, there are so few works that are actually from an Eastern perspective or have Eastern characters that when they actually are produced and they, are there ever going to be any roles, yeah. that, that, that's uh, race bending is felt, felt that heavily because there's so few works. If it was there more, it wouldn't be as much of an issue. Or if it was within that country that is already a majority like, Asian, then that's one thing. But when it's like the minorities within a country never get a chance, that's when it's felt the most, right? I, I mean, I, as someone who studies Chinese history. Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 again, this is from my perspective. Other people is going to have very different reactions to, to, to the, to fake China. To, I mean, <laughs> I, I even get weirded out by fake China in Avatar, for example, the TV show, not the, not the movies, which is very obviously uh, a reinforcement of colonial <laughs> yeah. attitudes. Yeah. But Avatar, the last airbender, even, even, I mean, 
but which is which is a work in which they actually actively try to be more positively reinforcing sort of an Asian perspective. But even then, I still feel like the, the world they constructed. What? Well, why does it have to be? What, why? Why is this image there? Why? Why does it ha- always have to be like that? Why is? Why is kung fu all the time? Why is there always kung fu in, in Asian world? Yeah, well, I think better. ultimately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's market marketable, partly. But, but Avatar, I mean, the whole world is Asian. There, like, what are you, what, you mean? They should have changed. Like, it, it, it's an, no, no. every character is Asian in Avatar, is it not? Like, is it just they just not yes. it properly, or well, like? Well, why did why is Tibet? Why is the Air Nation, which is uh, the the Tibet uh, SB, pretty mm-hmm. much? Well, why are there certain repeating uh, motifs that I see in movies, like uh, I was Seven Years in Tibet and stuff like that, also in this repeated in this. Why, why, why paint in this this very specific image over the bed? Again, it's, it's not that easy to explain why I feel this way. It's mm. it's not it's almost not so much a very logical. Yes, this is the way. It, 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 this is this. This is this. Hence, I should I should be. It's it's more of a emotional. It's also more of an emotional reaction. But yeah, this that's my perspective. Other people will feel very differently. Every, other people have very different experience to these kind of works and. This kind of person. even other Chinese people could have very different perspectives. Mm. So I, I'm sort of done with the, my whole spiel. So sorry. <laughs> I take a while. What about you, Bill? We feel like we've left you out as the, the token wa- yeah, sorry. Western white person on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you guys make a lot of good points. Uh, I I do wonder, you know, what kind of stereotypes does um, Asia have about white people? Mm. You know, <laughs> we we see a lot of white views of of Asia. But how how about the other direction? You know, what? if we did get an an Essos uh, POV, what would they say about Westeros? Mm-hmm. You know, would they have similar you know thoughts about you know here all those white people? They're just power mad, and they're you know they just like to conquer everybody, and which isn't always true. You know, we see a lot of examples of that not being true. On you know? the viewpoint of like Jorah the Andal, the way people treat Jorah, right, or view mm-hmm. him. I think you see a bit of it, and and don't they view the West as backwards? Well, they they make fun of him because he wears armor. They they think that's uh, <laughs> right. feminine to wear armor, to not fight fight naked, or it's it's uh, <laughs> weak. And I think one captain, one Selsword captain, calls it a senseless savage land, and they yeah. call it the, the Sunset Kingdoms. And I think uh, Jorah describes Khal Drogo as not regarding Westeros as any anything more than a collection of rocks out in the middle of the ocean, not worth not worth sailing across. Yeah. We get a few insights into the sort of the low regard that some of the West, some of the Easterners regard the Westeros as. Yeah, to go back to your, yeah, I think a point you made early on. I mean, I do think there are plenty of cases where Essos is kind of presented with that moral, cultural kind of high ground uh, compared to Westeros. Um, You know, Westeros, you know, we get plenty of insight on all the ways that it is deficient. Uh, I think that's Mm -hmm. true, but I think ultimately, you know, it's that same point uh, that Bing has has you know come back to is this. This idea that the, that's not necessarily the problem. It's not that, you know, the West is always great and the East is always bad, but it's that the West is is us and the East is other. The East is mm. is unfamiliar, um, ultimately. And I think that I think you can make the case, I guess, like where I ultimately fall on this article is that I do think it's I think I mentioned before, I do think it's a kind of a pretty shallow analysis. I feel like it's didn't go mm-hmm. as in depth on, you know, post-colonial thought as it could have. I don't mm. think it went as de- in-depth in the books uh, as it could have. It could have, you know, examined mm. things like Dorne, like we talked about more thoroughly. But I do like that it's presenting the argument. Uh, I don't agree with every piece of it, but I like having these kinds of discussions about it. Mm-hmm. Um, like I even, yeah. when I was reading this, uh, and, and to be fair, it's been a long time since I've read A Dance with Dragons, but I was like constructing this idea in my head of uh, Quentin having his own kind of like heart of darkness experience where like <laughs> Daenerys is Colonel Kurtz and all this stuff. And I wanted to kind of explore that more. Like, I don't know. I just like <laughs> thinking about, uh, thinking about it in those terms and kind of examining these things. Like, I think you could think too, I think there's a lot you could write about the fact that Westeros itself is obviously heavily colonized, right? You know, it started out as the children of the forest mm-hmm. and the first men yes. came and then the Andals came and it was a lot more it magical down. back then too. And then it was yeah. wiped out, right? It was, it, and that was an east-west, uh, you know, obviously kind of colonization that happened. It's a little different, right? You know, our understanding of imperialism and colonization is kind of a more um, kind of post-enlightenment idea, you know, age of exploration idea. But still, there's a lot of, you know, different uh, different mm. uh, interesting avenues, I think, that could be advanced uh, along this line. Yeah, and, and it, it 
it does to some extent dispute the notion that the West is this unified concept or this homogenous group when you have the Northerners, the, the, the blood of the first man strongly um, mm-hmm. feuding with the Andals, the Roynar. This, you know, you could argue that the people in uh, King's Landing have much more in common with the people of the Free Cities than they do with the Northerners or the Wildlings. And the, the Northerners have much more in common with the Wildlings uh, than the people of the Southern Kingdoms. And the, the people of Dawn have much more in common with the people of Lys and Tyrosh than they do with the people above, you know, in the Southern and the Northern Kingdoms. So, um, yeah, yeah this idea well. of the West. Because, <laughs> I mean, I guess in, in uh, Europe, you could say the idea of the West wasn't really cemented until, I don't know, the Crusades maybe, when they were united under under Christendom, and maybe – Maybe the the Greeks had as much as much trade with people in the Middle East as they did with the Spanish. You know, it wasn't. These are sort of new, more recent concepts that have developed through um, through I don't know politics and religion, and they were you know through natural tribal politics. I always just kind of find it hilarious in which fantasy, how much fantasy just sort of reinforces history. I mean, in Martin's case, it's understandable because he actually is taking. He himself actively acknowledges that he is taking. He, elements from history that he is actually sort of writing fake history at some points mm-hmm. but you see like robert jordan uh lord of the ring series with tolkien in which they have you you're, you're writing fantasy but there's so much you used to see so much western history in your fantasy world it's, it's again it's not a bad thing high fantasy is a product of the last hundred years right and they're mm-hmm. all in this this is what high fantasy is, but there could be other fantasy as well, as you're saying, right? Yeah. It's so tied mm-hmm. to history. Try some new stuff. Go, cr- here, like. go crazy. Go, go, go completely <laughs> wacko. Yeah. I will say this, though, um, kind of offering a counterpoint. I think ultimately yeah. it's really hard, obviously, to write outside of what you know. You know, yeah. I think that every oh, every yes. type of writing will obviously draw on some kind of experience. And I think, too, if if uh, if an author was brilliant enough to construct a setting that was totally alien it probably wouldn't resonate with any kind of audience because they would have no touchstone, right? They wouldn't be able to kind of interpret or understand. Like if we had a fantasy written by an alien, we probably wouldn't be able to appreciate it. it probably <laughs> wouldn't probably wouldn't sell very well. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's the kind of, you know, other side of it. But I think what ultimately the point is like, there should be more people uh, hopefully successfully writing fantasy, right? That's the, that's the great, you know, mm-hmm. thing that we would like to see. I think ultimately yeah. more perspectives. Well, yeah. Different voices. That can't be a bad thing. I think, again, ultimately this article fails. I think new, the TV show is much worse mm. and much more actively offensive yeah. <laughs> it, what they're trying to do with, with the Essos and Dorn than the book ever does. I think the the books, they, it makes me raise my eyebrows a few times and, okay, why? Okay, it's this again. And that's that's the most it got out of me re, in regard with this problem. The, the TV actively is kind of repulsive to me at times. The whole so what do you, sorry. storyline, for example. Yeah, go ahead. That's awful. But, you know, I, I just do want to throw this out there. Um, yeah. Duncan mentioned earlier, we really don't really get a perspective from Essos that's truly sympathetic or truly like nuanced or three dimensional. I don't think we're really doing the TV show either, but it at least tries, I guess, with uh, Missande and uh, and Grey Worm, right? It tries it, at least. Fr- right? uh, well, but I think it, they frame it in a very Western perspective. Yeah, I think I that's never- true. Yeah. I never, I never see those these two characters as actually like an act, an other. Uh, well, I mean, I also say they're sympathetic characters from us. I just say slavers uh, is the word <laughs> that's a little bit low <laughs> on them. Otherwise, I think they're there. Well, Grey Worm and Missandei are certainly sympathetic, but they worship Danny. They consider themselves yeah, exactly. rescued by yeah. by Danny yeah. from the horrors of. of uh, slavery. They were civilized, and now they are. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. They're yeah, they're recovering. They're much- they're much more like um, like slaves from the American South than like um, yeah they were dragged know, like, to like being they're not even from there yeah. right they were taken there and, and now they're making the best mm-hmm. of their life that they can do yeah and I think that they're look, look slavery is a bad thing but you can have very nuanced discussions about slavery if you especially you're taking the way in which slavery is in this context which is slavery it's not but the writers of TV show especially is taking talking about slavery in a very much American history way. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah. which it's and and they they hire actors specifically to make that point, yeah, <laughs> even right. even more specific. Like the, we can't see at most of the Danny soldiers except for Grey Worm, and but almost every single slave character in the show is portrayed by a black actor. Why is that? 
Yeah, because specifically that, the slaves are from all all of Essos, all background, yeah. right? So they, no they, they, the Thraki they, don't make limits. By the way, it's the Thraki that catch yeah. them because he was trying to figure out. There's two criticisms of the article. One is Orientalism applied, but the second is just understanding of the works. There's yeah. times where he's just like, well, how did how did these guys get slaves? Well, did the Thraki bring them over? There's a whole network there. Now, whether that network is sustainable or reliable is one thing, but there is an explanation that the Thraki bring them there and then they're sold and trained and sent to the rest of Essos. It's a worldwide trade that has been now affected by Danny, and that's why they're feeling the repercussions of the rest of Essos. Some positives, but they're aware of what's going on. Yeah, um, that that's a problem. Again, books go much better, does this much well, I don't know better, but goes in, does in much more nuanced fashion. Um, and as in, in which you, I can at least say, okay, Martin is trying to engage with a problem. Mm-hmm. If it, uh, he's trying to engage with an issue. TV show is just, I'm, we're taking stuff that we know and just putting it out there that in, in the most entertaining way possible so that people, that a specifically American audience can have a much closer appreciation of it. Which again, okay, so they're trying to sell a TV show. That's what they want to do. Okay, that's fine, but... But it's not just it's not just active trying to sell a TV show. It's just the, the people who made the show are more, they don't know any better. more admired in Orientalism. Like Lee Martin yeah. knows what Orientalism is, whether yeah. he's still affected by it or not. At least he's in he knows what it is and his historic experiences. Like the people making a show, come on, they probably don't even know what it is, right? So it's, they're more in line with with the tropes. I have, I don't know Dan D and D that well enough to be able to say if they know this or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not – the dragon demands I'm not yeah. going to <laughs> psychoanalyze them <laughs> and blame them for anything. <laughs> not just them, but of course they have more power yeah. on it, right? But like the overall uh, – whoever's making the show. Well, I, get, and, and, yeah, I don't know. Right? Well, well, yeah, it's Hollywood. Who, yeah. who knows who's that makes the ultimate decision? I can just imagine the casting director. All right, a slave. We need a bunch of slaves. This is the description of, of who we need, and that's what the casting call is. And that's how simply it's done. It's just there's these particular models, these particular types of characters that they need to. Yeah. So it's all ingrained in the in the production itself. The unfortunate thing, right, is you would think that a a massive kind of production would have a little more awareness and nuance to it than like one old white guy in Arizona uh, writing stuff or in New Mexico writing stuff. Um, Well, it's the Hollywood thing, right? That's just a pervasive, long, long, big problem. I'm going to throw out like another interesting or at least point that was interesting to me that I thought that might be worth further investigation, which is that I, the only modern example in, in this world that I can think of of modern, quote unquote, example of a, of a successful uh, colonization is the uh, Targaryen colonization of Westeros. Mm. That's the only only case I can think of where it actually, you know, worked out, quote unquote, it was successful and they actually were able to in- institute a new regime. It's not as though they completely changed the civilization, but it's the, the only one I can think of where it seems like they got they they dug in and they they made it work. Mm-hmm. Is it so much a colonization? In this? They, they weren't like taking this land and then sending the resources back over Essos or something. They committed to coming to live here, right? They became part of the Westeros, and there there wasn't that many. It wasn't like Westeros was overflown with with Valyrians, right? It was actually just a very <laughs> small elite parts on top of the existing andal tradition and that's there was a bit of a like in this in the greens and the blacks right that was the andal uh, nobility was kind of like reasserting itself at that point mm. and, the, it reminds me of the mongols for, for almost like you know because the mongols weren't slowly overflow china right it was only a certain amount of people that got assimilated right mm. yeah the, are, i mean the, Val- the valerians are interesting because the valerians are almost like you know worshipped they're thought of as this this nation of gods that we we got the you know the westeros he got the last few skyons of but um you know they're not like they're not they don't, i guess they're a, they're a destroyed civilization so they might fold into that orientalist myth but yeah that was that was considered i guess maybe the equivalent would be like the roman empire the fall of the roman empire this this great civilization that once ruled all of essos and at that point it was a great you know united realm a united civilization the freehold that that uh, eventually collapsed it flew too close to the sun maybe but the mythology of uh, valeria is interesting to situate in the in the otherwise um exoticization and and demonization of the east mm-hmm. He mentions the stereotyping of the um, Middle East and uh, transitioning from the nomadic warrior to the to the to the terrorist figure. And I was wondering if you could see that reflected in A Song of Ice and Fire. In early books, we get the Dothraki horseback warriors, and then um, in Meereen, we get the Sons of the Harpy. Just this sort of sporadic uh, threat that appears, does great violence, and then disappears back into the woodwork. 
know about a terrorist. I mean, the, the Dothraki are much more like a stereotypical portrayal of a horde people. Hmm. Which, again, that their people think that people horse warriors have to be people who live nomadic lifestyle in the in the steppes of Eurasia have to act and behave in a certain specific way. And not all horde peoples are alike. <laughs> well, no, but I are mean not the same as the Huns. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the Sons of the Harpy, they, they, they seem yeah. to be enacting a, a campaign of, you know, lacking numbers and lacking resources, but ruling through fear, making the, the unsullied afraid to walk alone at night and, uh, I guess, turning the pressure cooker up on, on Danny, um, making Maybe. her make mistakes. Maybe. Um, again, I don't, again, I don't know exactly where Martin is drawing his inspiration. Um that could be it or it could be just going back to even older tropes of like the hasha scene mm. stuff like that so yeah. i don't know i think you could i think you could make uh, you know a lot of other cases of just kind of resistant groups to any any you know um situation of of colonization i'm sure that there's a lot of connections you could make to the, the specific sons of the harpy but i think I think it's worth, you know, asking the question, obviously, you know, given uh, George R. R. Martin's perspective, if he's specifically drawing on a like the modern understanding of what a terrorist is. Um, I think it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it might be. I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's like definitively not. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I can't go into Martin's head. Try the question, right? We can try. The, the, we can guess. The, modern, the difference is in, in modern terrorism is that the, the targets are civilians. Far more than in the past, where it would, would be more the military. Like, are the harpy targeting civilians, or are they targeting unsullied? Mm. They're doing both, I guess. I, I have to look at that in detail. But I, I think it still has to be kept in mind it's because Martin's been writing for such a long time. But while he may draw upon what happened later, that wasn't the impetus for writing this. Yeah, again, so it, this novel has been written for such a long time that it's very possible that is that the, what. The ideas that Martin originally had or was inspired by have now since changed, and his and the story has morphed. Um, and again, that's another sort of contextual thing that's never really covered. Uh, well, it's treated as an end product, right? It's it's not over, right? So we yeah. don't, yeah, we can't ultimately judge what happens in Slavers Bay until it's over. But to what it, yeah. you can you can still make interim decisions. Yeah, I mean, you can point out you can point out that there's there's this and this and that that sort of repeating images, or, yeah. or that repeating cliches. But uh, I, I think more the point that Hardy is trying to make is these this sort of evolving stereotype that this is what it was at the beginning of the 20th century and this yeah. is what it became towards the end of the 20th sure. century, and that is possibly uh, manifested in Martin's work, but. I mean, I guess it's more the TV show that he's looking right. at. You know what? The surprising is that he didn't talk about World of Ice and Fire. You think he would have talked about it, given what he was going through? Like, with I think this was published in uh, 2015. I think it was. Yeah. Oh, is it that? Yeah. Is it that old? Yeah. Yeah. It's also it mentions like it it talks about the fourth season having having finished in the the fifth season uh, starting in the show. So it, it to be clear. Oh wow! He didn't even get the yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, so. oh, yeah, he didn't see <laughs> exactly. that. Yeah. So <laughs> it doesn't have the there. full full context that we do, to be fair. Yeah. So what is the International Journal of Arts and Sciences? Is that where's that based out of? Could be anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Let me see. International Journal of Arts and Sciences. So I just looked it up. Actually, the World of Ice and Fire came out in 2014. How is time passed this fast? Why do we not have yeah. a six? Book? Come on. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> But it, it was late 2014, wasn't it? Wasn't it fall 2014? October. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So depending on when the article was sent for publication, it might have already been finalized. It could be months later when it was actually. It's a good question. When it was actually finalized, it doesn't have a date on it, does it? It just has the 2015. I'm just annoyed now. I've been waiting. We were so <laughs> excited for World of Ice and Fire, but I don't actually think I've I've read all of it. <laughs> I don't think anyone because... has read all of it. You're not supposed to read it front to cover the back cover. You just jump around and. and I think I skip it. most of the Targaryen stuff. I think I tried to read through the whole thing and fell asleep yeah. somewhere towards. Uh, well, then you have a the usable pillow. Further east you got, I I got sleepier. <laughs> Although I, the Targaryen part was good actually, because I because I actually figured out like who was who. Like before that, I, I never had a good handle of their dynasty. Ironically, I actually really loved all the Essos stuff, even though it was crazy. <laughs> just I just it was like the part of the world we'd visited the least, and it was fun just to hear him like. Just write all of this crazy stuff that wouldn't have any repercussions because we're never actually going there. It just invented this whole conspiracy about these fish people that were like <laughs> mating humans, and there's all these like alien relics everywhere. It just just seemed like he he went a bit crazy because he, he could. 
I mean, we have Fire and Blood coming out uh, in what, November. November. Good news for you, Duncan. All that Targaryen stuff you haven't read will be repackaged. In yeah. Oh, new good. Installed. I was just so, waiting for this one. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for the definitive edition. More in depth. Okay. Thank you, guys. Is that all? Or is there, is there any final comments <laughs> before we wrap up? I think. Uh, yeah. It's been fun. The advantage of people writing these articles is it gives you something to discuss in a more structured format. At least that you can something you can criticize or agree with. I agree. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think I agree to with the essay to the extent that he uh, Martin is relying on a lot of those tropes unconsciously or subconsciously, and he's challenging some of them, but he's also um, he's sort of yeah indulging in, in them a little bit. But I think it'll be interesting to see how it turns out, like how he resolves a lot of these conflicts. And I'll sort of reserve my judgment until then. Yeah. Like I was saying before, I think the kind of pr- part where it really becomes deeply problematic is that part where Daenerys dis- discards Essos as kind of like her training ground. And I think that we haven't seen yet what that looks like uh, mm. yet in the, in the in the books. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. OK, thanks for joining me, guys. Hey, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank and uh, to our listeners out there, check us out on podcastadviceandfire.com, on Twitter, Facebook, and even DeviantArt. And we shall see you next time. Thank you.